Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. My guest today is Eventide co-founder Richard Factor. I appreciate you joining us every week, and I'd like to share my intention that inspires this podcast. Time passes quickly. And I've learned that we should do what's in our hearts and do it well without apologies or excuses. I encourage you to create your life and art in your own unique way and express your artistry with joy and with abandon. Be willing to work uncompromisingly for what you believe in. Success will have a better chance of finding you when you live your life with integrity, focus, and passion. Be selfish with your discipline and selfless in your performance. And don't forget to have fun along the way. If you're joining us in our live audience today, we'll be inviting questions and comments during the second half of the show. So make it count and simply request an invite to speak. And my moderator, Dr. Lisa, will bring you on stage to join the conversation. <clears throat> Let me tell you about my guest today. One of the original founders of Eventide Clockworks, Richard Factor has seen a lot of changes in the world of audio and electronics. Richard is an inventor, blogger, and award-winning <clears throat> canoeer. He enjoys reading science, science fiction, humor, and spy books. His favorite beverage is ice water, favorite food, chocolate, and favorite color, blue. He's also the founder of SETI League, an international grassroots organization dedicated to privatizing the electromagnetic search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Eventide was founded in 1971 by recording engineer Stephen Katz, inventor Richard Factor, and patent attorney Orville Green. The business began in the basement of the Sound Exchange, a recording studio located in New York City. Katz asked Factor to build a gadget that could rewind analog tape back to a specific point on their Ampex multi-track recorder. The resulting device was a success for both them and Ampex. Their other early products included a two-second delay for telephone research and an electrostatic deflector for dispensing nanoliter quantities of chemical reagents. Now, let's find out what that means. Richard Factor, welcome to Making It. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> can, we hear, can we hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you fine. And Excellent. I can see you. Okay. I, I need to clarify something immediately on your Please. introduction. Yes. Okay. You said I am an award-winning canoeer. Yes, I did. I need to make it clear that that was not an award for canoeing. It was most improved in canoeing. <laughs> Thank you, because it was one of the first things that I wanted to ask you. I know. Feel free to <laughs> ask. I am not the world's great canoeer. I just got a lot better because I was the world's worst canoeer to start with. So uh, go right well, ahead. Well, I. I thought it'd be fun to mention in the intro because your bio that you sent me is atypical of any other guest that I've ever had, you know, which it's doesn't talk about your accolades. It just talks about fun things that you do, which was really kind of a blast for me to. I, I had, I had my accolades <clears throat> surgically removed some time ago. So um, no point. But, but I, I do know because you had told me that you have a, you actually have a plaque for most improved in canoeing at camp. So it at the beginning, training. you barely, you, you barely knew your way around a paddle, I'm guessing. Uh, yes, I had to be really stern with it or <laughs> bow to it. Take your pick. I'll go for no, both. I, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, as a kid, I went to summer camp and uh, they threw Where was that? canoes and we had to learn uh, in Maine, Wayne, Maine. Okay. We wrote songs about that to My Fair Lady tunes. Oh, perfect. Right. For your, the rain your summer. Rain stays, <laughs> the rain in Maine stays mainly in Wayne. So back in those days, because we went to summer, I went to summer camp also. Actually, my parents were co-owners of a summer camp in Northern Florida. So I grew up learning to canoe and treat a snake bite and all that stuff. Is the same thing for you? You know, survival <laughs> skills? Uh well, on the one hand, I'm still here. Uh, on the other hand, I do not attribute it to my ability to treat a snake bite. <laughs> Which, by the way, we learned we learned it incorrectly. They've changed the technology on on snake bite. Do you remember that? Did you do you have any no, memories I, of? Uh, all I, all I, I remember. Treating snake you do, Lisa. Is... <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, is that Dr. Lisa? Hi. This is Dr. Lisa? Yes. Richard, I have got to tell you, okay, I am so excited and a little scared. His bio was one of the most exciting reads. And it was like, I felt like I was on a roller coaster in the dark. I did not know what was coming. Right. But I knew I needed to freaking hold on really tight and keep my seatbelt on. <laughs> and, and so this interview, I'm sitting here leaning off of my seat already. But the snake bite, if I remember correctly, they told you to cut from one point of the bite to the other. And then you were to suck it out and spit it out. That's right. But not if you had uh, fillings because you didn't want the, the venom to get underneath your fillings and you absorb it into your. Yeah. So that's what I remember about snake bites. Just in case we're all together one day and you get bit. <laughs> it's that you well, remember I, it the way I, live, I do as well. Yeah, go ahead. I, I live I live in Arizona. And uh, when we moved out there, there were tarantulas on the driveway every day, but they seem to have dissipated. Huh. Uh, your your notion of treating a snake bite is very similar to what I have read. But having grown up originally in a big city, uh, I did not encounter any snakes of the uh, of the reptilian kind. <laughs> I have no idea why I learned that, but that's the Girl Scouts brownies, South Jersey. I did grow up. We we had garden snakes, not really, huh? you know, snakes where that was going to happen. But we did have enough woods and forests that I guess it was a good thing that someone thought I needed to know that. Let's just go there. Yeah, great. Uh, so did, did now you, we know. Not do you have weebelows? I don't remember weebelows. What is that? Uh, Weebelows was a word that I heard on a Seinfeld episode, and I had to look it up because I was never a scout. And it, it, I think it means we be loyal scouts. Oh, I remember that. Oh. No, we didn't have that. We yeah, did not have but that. I don't know. But I don't know if that was Girl Scout, just Boy Scouts. We, um, <laughs> boy, we could do this all day. I've got funny Boy Scout stories too. But I, the the one I'm, that comes to mind is. Our our boy, our boy Scout, our troop leader quit. We were so bad. You know, we, we drove him to the point of quitting being a scout leader. <laughs> I, I applaud that. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I came to the conclusion that I never, ever wanted to be a camp counselor yeah. <laughs> after the way we treated them. Well, is your, your job, you know, as, you know, co-founder of Eventide, is it somewhat like a camp counselor? Sometimes I know that you don't micromanage your team, but you still are kind of the leader or one of the leaders. Uh, I, I used to be. Uh, you know, my partner, Tony Aniello, is now running the company. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have squatulated to Sedona, Arizona. And uh, to use the, uh, the famous Tom Lehrer line, I, I love giving free advice to people who are happier than I am. But that's really... <laughs> Most of uh, most of what I do, I'm I'm old. I've I've got a lot of experience in the business, but I not only don't micromanage, I don't manage either. That was never one of my skills, and uh, right. remains thus. Well, what were your skills? Um, ideas? Uh, yeah, I uh, when I fill out forms nowadays, what's your profession? Inventor. Okay. How do I know I'm an inventor? I've got patents. That's the one thing yeah. you can't argue with. Um. Speaking of looking up uh, things, you know, there are, there are multiple things in the intro that I read that I have no idea what they mean. I did look them up, of course. Um, what's a, what is dispensing nanoliter quantities of chemical reagents? What is that? Uh, well, you know, uh, when, when you put in an eye drop, that's probably a good fraction of a milliliter. A mm -hmm. nanoliter is one, one million of a milliliter. Okay. And uh, we built this device uh, at the behest of the, uh, the New, York, uh, New York State Health Department. And it was simply a, a needle with liquid going through it, liquid being a chemical reagent, just water with something dissolved in it, perhaps, or an acid or a base. And uh, varying the frequency and the number of cycles of energy that went through a electrostatic deflector and something that vibrated the needle, you could pick the exact number of really tiny droplets that went into, uh, went into a, a vessel of some sort. Mm -hmm. Thanks for explaining that. Was that clear? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, very. Absolutely. <laughs> I, no, I can you... work on that. I, 
We no, it's ex- extremely curt because I know what a milliliter is. Good. So you, you started me with yeah. a confidence booster. <laughs> Good. Uh, one of the things that I, that I find fascinating about you, of, of course, I've known of your, your inventing, being a, a fan and longtime user of Eventide products. I still have my, my vintage. It probably belongs in a museum, but my H3000 that still works. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm joining it to the museum soon. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but one of the other things that I didn't know about you is a lot of your inventions were used by for other things in aviation, for the police department. Um, you know, the perhaps you could tell the I Love Lucy connection and, you know, like these sure. random, what feels like random things, but give an, give an overview of some of your things that people would be surprised about. Well... Um, sure. Uh, I, I invented a moving map for an airplane because I got my pilot's license when we moved to New Jersey. And like any, any beginner at anything, I, I made some mistakes. None of them, as it turns out, were lethal. And one day I was flying to uh, Burlington, Vermont, as it turns <laughs> out, and I didn't follow the instructions of the, uh, the controller precisely because I was a little bit disoriented. And it was harmless. It was a calm day. There wasn't anyone else around. But realizing I had made a mistake, I said, you know, if I just put a moving map in the airplane, I wouldn't have uh, made that mistake. Right. But they didn't make moving maps. I said, well, wait a minute. I've got to have a moving map. So, uh, so we just went ahead and designed that. It, uh, are some of the things that your inventions that you've come up with are are they things that in hindsight are seem extremely obvious like that like a moving map would make more sense than a, a stagnant map when you were well, moving? Well, one of one of the most obvious ones uh, is I uh, I'll get a little scatological here. Uh, one day I we got a dog, a, a terminally cute Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. But when my wife said, I want a dog, I said, can we get an atomic dog? <laughs> uh, one that just takes a little capsule when it's born and doesn't have any of those outputs that you, uh, <laughs> you have a problem with. Just the input. She said, right. no, no, I want a bio dog. Right. So we got, again, terminally cute. We love him. But he has these outputs. And mm-hmm. one day I was unpacking something from Amazon or whatever. And uh, nowadays you don't put packing peanuts in anything. Uh, you have these uh, these little sacks of uh, of air, and I said, "Well, wait a minute. Why use plastic bags for the dog output? You just cut the top off of those, and you can put it in there if you don't mind it being transparent." And uh, I filed a patent for a way to manufacture those things to make that easier. And when you want obvious, well, you can't patent something that's obvious. I never <laughs> I never got a patent on that, mm-hmm. but I still think it's a good idea. It's a great idea. How did you end up in Sedona? You're welcome. Say again? How did, how did you and your wife end up in Sedona? A beautiful choice. Great place. Okay. Well, the, the first question uh, would be, why did we leave New York? And the answer to that is very short and simple. Winter. How did we end up in Sedona? We drove cross country. We were trying to figure out what do we want to do to get away from winter? And we sort of had uh, either Santa Fe, New Mexico, or, or maybe San Diego, California in mind. But Santa Fe has winter, high elevation. And uh, we never made it to San Diego because we stopped in Sedona. I said, this is gorgeous. And she said, yeah, this is gorgeous. Let's look for a house. So there we are. Short How long have you been there? 10 years. 10. So let's talk about your early years, like growing up. Did you think that i mean were you picturing that you would be in quite the assumption you've made there (laughs) of the growing up yeah (laughs) yeah that was yeah that's true i did make an assumption and incorrectly (laughs) uh you know when i mean actually one of the cool things about you is that you've maintained your um playfulness you know through being the ceo of a uh, a profoundly impactful company uh, and certainly in the music business, but I like Actually, that. About thank you. you. And thank you. <laughs> I mean, I think it's great that you don't take it all too seriously. How can you? Well, good point. Good point. 
So were you a musician growing up or, or, and always tinkering with things? Did you take apart radios or, and put them back together? Did you envision yourself as somebody that would be working and, and a leader in the electronics and broadcasting field? Okay. That was four questions. Good count. So the, uh, the answer to the first, the first one is, did I play music or was I a musician? Answer, absolutely not. I am 100% talent free. But and, you love music. It's really a big, oh, important part of your life. Absolutely. It does not require a lot of talent to listen to music. And when I say 100% talent free, it's not totally 100% because I like to sing. Oh. And my talent with regard to singing is that I have really good pitch perception. And as soon as I start singing, I know I'm off key and I stop. That's my talent. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the tinkering is concerned, yes. I remember when I was short, which was quite some time ago, I climbed up on something. Thought, oh, look at this old radio and started taking it apart. Uh, I remember that uh, I clipped some mica capacitors out of a radio. And why don't these light up? They have all these little colored dots on them. But uh, I eventually figured that out. And I've always tinkered. I've, I'm a ham radio operator and always have been. Well, always since age 13, I think. And uh, did I consider myself or that I would likely become a leader in anything? No, I never thought about it for a minute. Mm -hmm. You just followed. Have, have you been living your life just basically following your desire, your passion, your curiosity? Yes, yes, and yes, in that order. So three <laughs> And it's, it's been wonderful. I, I am so lucky you can't imagine. Did you, did your parents encourage you to do that to, or did they want you to get a job and, and make sure you my mother got wanted me to be a doctor. Okay. I explained to her, I don't like people all that much. <laughs> um, my, uh, <laughs> No, the the answer is they wanted me they wanted me to be a profession uh, in a profession of some sort, but uh, at some point they decided it was hopeless. Mm -hmm. Did they live to see your success? Yes. Good. Yeah, they've. Uh, my my mom died uh, at ninety five, and she made it to the year two thousand. She's always saying, "Boy, if I make it to two thousand, I'm going to be a science fiction character," <laughs> and she did, and she did. And was. It's wonderful. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. They, they were uh, eventually they were content with my uh, my life choice. Enough to quit wor worrying about their son and your well-being. And I eventually, eventually, when when I started Eventide, my mother said, um, but you have a job. You know, do you do you really want to do that? Do you want to leave work? You know, what are you going to do? I said, well, you know, if this doesn't work out. I'll get another job. I uh, I suggested, never had to, never had to work. That is really remarkable, but you are aware of that. Uh, I don't know how remarkable it is. I know it's somewhat, but uh, you know, sometimes you get lucky. Yeah, I mean, you're using the word luck, and I know that uh, certainly, and I would imagine all business, but certainly in the music business, luck is a, a huge element. You know, it's not just based S on sadly. Sadly, it is. I know some immensely talented people yeah. who are, are eking out a living or not. And right. they have they have every right to. But uh, you do have to be lucky, uh, especially in performing. Absolutely. And, and I that's my observation as well. I, I you know, it's it's fascinating. It, it's not linear. I think like in other businesses where. You know, as you keep moving up the ladder, you stay up there. It's not as much of this. No. You're famous, and then you can't get arrested the next year, and then yeah. you're famous again. It's it's unlike any other mm -hmm. uh, experience that that I've ever had, and I've certainly been in that ride, and and you know it well, you know, because again, you you are a businessman, you're an inventor, you're sort of a you're well, not sort of, you're a visionary, in in that. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the things that came to mind when I was reading up on you is I, I played a gig years ago for Disney, and it was an award ceremony for the, their scientists, their inventors. They're called Imagineers. 
I, 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 I know them. One one of my uh, broadcasting buddies uh, worked for uh, Disney Imagineering in uh, Long Island. And one of the, I found them fascinating people, and they were uh, mm-hmm. one of the scientists who who won an award that year was intrigued by music, was a, a fan, and he came up to talk to me afterwards. And And I asked him, and this is way before I was interviewing people for shows, but I was just curious about his job as he was asking me about mine. Do you, do you remember his name? I don't. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, and because it was probably about a good 15 years ago or so. Um, mm-hmm. but, um, but anyway... I said, so can, what is your job actually? Can you describe it? Or, and he said, well, we're basically, we're all put in this room and we're encouraged to fail. That's our job. We, we are told to try anything. And the wow. more we fail, the happier they are, because that's where these ideas come from that have never been executed before in envision. And I, th- I thought that was such a great answer. And I thought of you, not that you failed, <laughs> <laughs> Not that you failed, but that you've been kind of fearless. I mean, you think of something and you figure out how to do it, you know, which is how the company started. You know, and I mean, you, you, you're you one of the early um, explorers of digital delay and, and use of reverb and flanging and phasers and, and all those things. Um, but it didn't stop. Like, you, there's, it seems like you have a, an unlimited point of view in how you look at things and how you approach things and in your openness. And I'm really curious about that uh, because again, I, I know it, it exists in you, not only because of what you and your company have designed and continue to, but the fact that, you know, your inventions are used outside of the realm of where you originally envisioned using them, not your aviation, but again, like your, um, the, what the police scanners use or certainly for the delays for people not using profanity on the air, they were using your systems. Can talk about that for a second? Um, I, I've been accused of having something called idiophoria. Really? Or maybe idiophoria. I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't even know how it's pronounced, but somebody said, you've got that. And uh, between coming up with uh, with goofy ideas, reading a lot of science fiction, which uh, probably accounts for it to some extent, and the fact that uh, I'm never too far from a keyboard since my handwriting is execrable, whenever I come up with something, I just write it down, and um, you know, of course, discard ninety somewhere between ninety and ninety five percent of it, and the rest of it I write a blog, and sometimes I end up saving the world just with that uh, that one blog. Um, it's, it's hard to explain. You just get an idea and you don't discard it immediately or try not to forget it. And sometimes I think they're good. Occasionally other people do too, not often. <laughs> well, and your blog, um, which I've started reading and, and I enjoy, um, one of the things that I think really describes who you are personally is you. I read that you don't really enjoy writing. You enjoy having written. Yes. <laughs> I understood that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you give an example of your blog? And, and uh, Dr. Lisa, if you don't mind putting up the link to the blog, or, or uh, Richard, you could tell everybody what it is. But um, there's like a, an ex- a great example of a story is uh, I, never brought, I never bought a tramp steamer to import shrimp. That's kind of obscure, <laughs> but can, it's a great story. Can you just give a brief version of that? Uh, I don't think there is a brief version because uh, the the person with whom I did not partner in not buying the tramp steamer to not import shrimp from Venezuela uh, is, uh, is somebody you might enjoy interviewing. He's, he's, oh, okay. he's a, a very, very old friend, a wonderful conspiracy theorist, and uh, and had this notion that if uh, if we bought this tramp steamer and went to Venezuela, and caught a lot of shrimp, froze them in blocks of ice, and brought them back to this country. Well, shrimp were expensive. I know shrimp were expensive because I like shrimp and sometimes I eat them. So thinking about this, I said, you know, no. Uh, that, that was basically my, my response. And it turns out that um, 
the whole thing was a scam by the guy who was selling the tramp schemer who ended up in jail. Right. And so um, while I rarely give financial advice on my blog, uh, I did mention this is a bad idea, even if someone else offers it to you. And uh, a very small number of financial advice blogs that I've written have worked out very nicely. So uh, I think I did the right thing there. Well, I, I take your advice to heart, which is don't invest or get involved in something you know nothing about. That's, that's well, you're, your tag. You're elaborating. you're elaborating. I was saying don't buy a tramp steamer and try <laughs> to import shrimp from Venezuela. More if, specifically. Uh, if you go too far with that and you never get involved in anything you don't know anything about, it's not as much fun. There's, there's another story that you talked about on um, recently shopping for a boulder. And one of the things that I found kind of fascinating about it, and, and in, in some ways I wonder how it applies to your inventing and working, uh, but it's basically, here's, it's number one, here's a how-to on how to fill an empty space in your front yard with a boulder. Decide that that empty space needs your driveway, that your driveway needs a boulder. Find someone with a heap of boulders. You know, that's, but, but essentially, do you look at things that need to be done and then just figure out how to do them? And is there a randomness to your, your inventiveness? Another two questions. Uh, yes. And yes. <laughs> uh, however, I have to give credit to Karen, the wife, who yeah. was the one who looked at the, uh, the driveway and said, we need a boulder because uh, I am probably the worst person on earth to want to do stuff around the house. Uh, to me, if, if there's water leaking in over the, the top of the bed, that's when I start thinking, gee, is it ever going to rain again? And in Sedona, that's a good question. <laughs> but if I think it's going to rain, maybe I'd have that leak fixed. Uh, so I, I would give her credit uh, for the, uh, the boulder suggestion. But I'm always thinking of things that need to be done, whether it's just saving the world or uh, far more important stuff like uh, like finding a good source of chocolate, which I could report on if you want. Um, Please do. do. You ready? Where can we find your favorite chocolate? This I'm is listening. not my favorite chocolate. This is the best bargain on earth. Oh, OK. Costco chocolate chips. Are you kidding me? Wow. I am not kidding. They are yummy and they're $2 a pound in big uh, two kilogram bags. Mm -hmm. Fabulous deal. And uh, they're wonderful for snacking because you can have one or a hundred and you always get exactly the amount you want. They're, they're delicious and they're close to free. And are you capable of having just one? Oh, sure. Sometimes I have none. <laughs> I'm, I'm having none right now. Right. <laughs> Which is harder? I'm sorry? Which is more of a challenge, none or one? Well, I actually spend more time eating none than, than eating uh, whatever <laughs> quantity. So you're more practiced at that, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although if you're going to eat one of something, I recommend M&Ms. Uh, peanut or chocolate? No, no, just there. You never want to put nuts in your chocolate. They just take up space where the chocolate goes. <laughs> Boy, I agree. I couldn't agree with you more, <laughs> Lisa. Yeah, <laughs> these are good tips, right? <laughs> I'm, just like, I'm so done. You thought you were going to be learning about reverb. Uh, no, I knew I wasn't. That's what was, <laughs> exactly. That's what was I'm, I'm when the I read his bio. I was like, you're nothing about reverb. Right. right. I was like, I have no idea what this any of this means, and it doesn't matter because he won't be talking about it anyway. That's right. <laughs> so you're, hey. you're the one who's asking the questions, so I'll talk about whatever you <laughs> whatever you want. I want to talk about your your Grammy win and that experience for you, which was pretty recent, actually. Um, yeah. Congratulations. I well deserved. Thank you, and uh, I. I have to say it was a total surprise. Um, we got a phone call from uh, the guy in charge there and said, can, uh, can we schedule a call? When I say we, I'm referring to me and my partner, Tony. Mm -hmm. And neither of us really had any idea. I didn't know there was such a thing as a technical Grammy. Or if I did, you know, I had forgotten about it. And he calls up and says, you won the technical Grammy. 
I said, well, that's fabulous. Thank you. That's wonderful. And then I looked at the other people who had won the technical Grammy and uh, that very much amplified my feelings about it. So yeah. quite the honor. Yeah, you're in esteemed company with that. Yeah. Um, Neil Pornow called you personally, the yeah. then president of, of Neris. That's yes. that must have been cool. Uh, it it absolutely was, but uh, I I'm sure I'm speaking for Tony as well that we we never gave it a moment's thought, and uh, it was such a total surprise. I, I was right. really shocked. Mm -hmm. That's great. By the way, is is if Tony ends up being in our audience today, let us know so we can bring him on stage to say hi. I wasn't sure if he was going to be joining the conversation. Uh, well, he at this very moment is, is at work. I, I could uh, I could probably try to drag him over here if one of you guys wants to call him. Does he you go want, by you Anthony want me to... or Tony? Uh, Anthony Agnello, A-G-N-E-L-L-O. Well, we have an Anthony in the audience, but I don't know if this is the same Anthony. I'm going to check real quick. I, I nope, doubt different it. Different Anthony. Um, okay. Yeah. So what would you like to talk about today? I've got more questions, but I want to give you a moment. What's important <laughs> to you? Um, well, gee, I guess because uh, uh, I'm going to deliberately eschew politics, if that's all right. Absolutely. Um, one, one of the things I've been uh, minimally involved with uh, is, uh, is electric cars. Uh, back in 05, I bought a Prius. Uh, mm -hmm. This was like the second generation of Prius. You got good mileage. I was commuting at the time. And well, well into my computing, or computing, commuting career uh, without having had a serious accident or death. And I predicted when we moved to New Jersey, I said, you know, I'm a little nervous because I'm going to be driving 15, 20,000 miles a year. I don't want to die. So I, I'm a pretty careful driver, or try to be, don't speed, etc. And I thought the, the Prius was a perfect car because it got double the mileage of what I had been driving. And where I lived at the time, which was rural New Jersey, we had power failures. And so I'm thinking, you know, I could get a generator. But you know, I already have a generator. It's called a Prius. And so I did this whole project about turning the car into a power source for the house. Mm. And I, I got interested in, uh, in electrical, uh, electric vehicles at the time. And uh, in fact, my blog is on the Priups, P-R-I-U-P-S website. And I, I did that site uh, sort of in tribute to, uh, to using the Prius to power your house. Ford, uh, Ford, the auto manufacturers, finally caught on just recently. They made, they made one of their pickup trucks provide uh, power to a house. It only took them 16 years, I think. So uh, that's, that's one of my things. And uh, I, I recently got a Tesla, and I'm having a lot of fun criticizing it. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a great car. It's, it's absolutely <laughs> wonderful to drive, but you can't take power out of it to power your house. It's very irritating. Right. Well, and, since, since you're in the, the, um, the development engineering inventing business, do you have direct access to Tesla? Can you call the CEO of that company and give him absolutely. your, absolutely. I, I could call and have him. You? Got a phone. Right, right now. I, he doesn't know me from Adam. Yeah, well, no, I'm not so absolutely sure. not. I could call him. I could do anything I want, but he's not going to pay any attention to me. If he, if he were, he would make a really, really trivial change to the software. Right. I know people are going to be saying there's no such thing as a trivial change, but there is. They've got a moving map display, and you press a button, and it's either north up or heading up. And I said, well, instead of heading up northeast, west, south, why don't you just put numbers around it, and then you'll have a compass. I mean, you know, changing text. Do right. they listen to me? No. So they're uh, lost, I, right, I, Richard? I'm, say again. They're lost. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> so uh, no, I can't call up uh, Mr. Musk. Although I, I did give him a shout out many, many years ago before he was uh, still before he was Elon Musk for real. Right on the way up. Yeah. 
um, tell me about the the technology or or your not even so much the technology your personal experience with you and Tony and and your crew when the your first H nine H nine one zero piece of gear was used for I Love Lucy for speeding up uh, or speeding up or slowing down and maintaining pitch. That's the that's okay. the what's the story? Let, but let also, just... how did that feel for you? Like when all that happened? Okay, let let me disambiguate that just a bit. Okay, Tony designed the H nine ten, the harmonizer. Mm-hmm. That was possibly our our most important uh, and most valuable product, certainly in the first few decades of our existence. We sold thousands and thousands of those, and Tony designed it from the ground up. Uh, however, that is not the product that we used to change the speed of I Love Lucy, which was another Tony product, the H949. And the reason is the 949 had a de-glitch card in it. There was no such thing really as DSP in those days. And trying to use the H910 would have, uh, would have created glitches in the audio. But when we had the 949, uh, then I combined that with a computer control that would, uh, that would both change the pitch of the signal and change the speed of the video tape recorder, which is what we used in those days. And you could add or subtract uh, a few seconds or a minute so you could get another commercial in it. But uh, honestly, I really didn't think all that much about it. As as I mentioned uh, before before this podcast, uh, my personal feeling is that if God wanted pictures to fly through the air, he'd have given them tickets. And I know I Love Lucy is out there heading to the nearest stars and what have you. But uh, I was much more excited by the things that our products did to audio, which is which is my big love. Well, let's talk about audio. We're you know, uh, your your gear was used on Led Zeppelin's Cashmere, Frank Zappa and Jimmy Page, David Bowie, mm-hmm. um, ACDC, Back to Black, Lou Reed with David Bowie, uh, Steve Winwood back in the high life again. I I know there's many more. I've used your gear on pretty much everything I've done uh, that's ended up on the radio and on TV. So that's got to be pretty exciting. T- tell me Absolutely. about your that side of your lucky life that you have. Well, the exciting part for me, because I was very young in those days, well, not very young, but young, uh, was the remarkable, remarkable ability that I had to walk up to uh, the stage door uh, in the, uh, in, I guess it was the uh, Academy of Music or whatever in New York. And I was there so often, they just let me in without a stage pass. Now that is, that is really impressive. And I, I looked the part then too, but. Uh, Meaning long hair and uh, yeah. bell bottoms, right? No, it was always jeans and a t-shirt, but uh, definitely hair. Right. And it was, it was just a great feeling. Uh, yeah both helping these uh, these bands and interacting with them and hanging out and visiting and uh, offering advice on occasion. Remember the word about free advice. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was wonderful, but not to uh, skim over the fact that I spent most of my hours uh, leaning over a, uh, a hot light table doing circuit boards with razor blades and tape. That's that's really what I did most of my uh, early years, which is um, surprising in the fact that you are so um, personable. You know, a lot of people who are isolated, you know, that are techs, geeks, even musicians, artists, they they don't have interpersonal social skills. But you're really a fun guy. I mean, you're you're I, comfortable. I think they must have been beaten. They were probably beat into me by somebody. I have no idea how that happened. Assuming it's true, I don't necessarily admit it either. Were Were your mom and dad or siblings um, social, like big personalities? Um, I would say average. Average. Hmm. Yeah, I I think maybe maybe one reason I seem so voluble, etc., is because at my age, uh, it's almost impossible to embarrass yourself. 
because it's it's probably already been done and there's it, well it's it's been done i i live out in the boonies and uh you know you you can think of me anything you want um uh, it doesn't really matter my I um I, <laughs> there's um a wonderful artist, Melissa Manchester, who's a dear friend of mine, who basically broke it down for me, like you're saying. And she said, it's essentially as you get older, she goes, my shit a giver doesn't work anymore. You know, and I, I think that's <laughs> kind of really well said. It's like, whatever. You just kind of shoulder shrug. And, and I, I know I'm in my mid 60s. You know, I've, I've, it's already, I've been on that path for a while, too. And I think it's, it's really healthy. I, it's one of the cool yeah. things that I, I admire in people who are older, the our elders. And I'm not just talking about you, but like, you know, when people get into their 80s and 90s, they just, they you know, they'll say what's on their mind, you know, that's done yeah. lovingly or not. But it's like there's there's less apologies. Yeah, I, I think my main goal uh, as I as I enter my early dotage is just not to be cranky. That's all. <laughs> so many people got cranky. Right. I don't I don't see the point of that. So I, <laughs> I um, by the way, Lisa, um, since we're um, tending towards the last 15 minutes or so of the show, uh, if there's anybody from Eventide that wants to jump on and, and join the conversation or any other audience members or Lisa, of course, you uh, I am any so questions, keen. comments? I have one. This is I'm yes, I have one, but I will let you finish and get to that point. No, I'm 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 ready to bring on a point. couple of questions. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Because I'm like the way your mind works, Richard, like anyone could figure that out, but let's just pretend. I want to know if you remember the first thing you invented because I truly believe you were a kid. And I want to know what are what is the first thing or one of the first things that you remember inventing. Well, let me, can I modify the question slightly? Any way you'd uh, like. Say, what what are the first uh, electrical things I played with or worked with, etc. And it was my pleasure and curse uh, in my early youth to have electric trains. Oh yeah, mm. Lionel in particular, not the American yes. Flyers, but the Lionels. And I realized that if I stole enough mercury from the school science lab. And if I disassembled enough pencils, I could make really, really neat arc lamps with a Lionel train transformer um, and, and mercury and graphite pencils. And the most amazing thing is that I still have good vision nowadays, despite the fact that I was probably staring into these ultraviolet arcs for hours at a time um, while... I guess amalgamating uh, dimes with mercury because I had plenty of mercury, and uh, that was that was great fun. Did you ever set the house on fire, accidentally? No, no, I never did. The worst thing I did was to I think it was to destroy the bath mat with potassium permanganate and <laughs> sodium oh, thiosulfate. Yeah. We've all done that at least once. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure you have. <laughs> The big oh, mistake, yeah. though, was A, putting it in the washing machine before my parents right. got home, and B, not realizing that sodium thiosulfate or maybe the potassium permanganate would sort of shred the bath mat. And it did not get along very well with the washing machine. <laughs> I want, I, I know that you're really interested. I, you were talking about uh, the Prius and Tesla. I know that you're really a, a fan uh, and fascinated and interested in solar energy uh i've Absolutely. read in some can can you speak on that for a moment and your your yeah, thoughts well, ideas did, did did you read the blog where i saved the world again yes i uh -huh. did i know i know what you're thinking yeah um uh fairly recently actually it it suddenly occurred to me i'm reading about uh how people don't like the idea of solar power because there are plenty of people who don't like anything really, but I've got, uh, I've got solar power on my house. I use it to charge the car. So I'm not worried about the price of gasoline today, which is as close as I'm going to get to politics. But it occurred to me that uh, if you use the ocean as a platform for solar power, 
you can make as, as big a solar island as you want to. Nobody's going to stop you. There's plenty of ocean. And then uh, instead of having all these, uh, these tramp steamers, if you will, running on bunker fuel and spewing sulfur into the atmosphere, you just have them stop by these, uh, these solar islands and pick up uh, hydrogen, which is created uh, on the spot with the solar energy and electrolyzing the water. And while they're busy doing that, uh, you can get lithium out of, out of seawater. There's actually a significant amount of lithium that you can just uh, extract from the seawater. So that, that was, you know, free energy, free lithium, yeah. good stuff. And are there no any... No in... yet. Why? And are, I'm going to give you a multi-point question again. Uh, why and are there environmental impacts uh, with sea life, with fish, with whales, with dolphins, birds? Well, I, I doubt that it's of any great significance. Obviously, everything has some environmental impact, including a butterfly beating its wings that starts a hurricane, if, if you want to believe that. But uh, these things would float. So they're, they're not going to uh, block any whales from their migration path. And uh, Lord knows there's plenty of, uh, plenty of water to turn into hydrogen. And there's, I forget the statistics, I think 5,000 or maybe 5 million, who knows, times the amount of lithium and seawater that there is in land. So I, I see them being relatively harmless unless you get pirates. Is this something that you think you have the the power or the the what would would it be the access or the the notoriety i'm trying to think of the right word where you could actually propel this idea and make it happen no I'm wondering why it's not happening and it's, no. it's well it's not happening because um as, as much as i'd like to gloss over the difficulties putting a uh, an island of solar cells in the middle of the ocean does have engineering difficulties mm -hmm. um you you got most of the time probably i, I imagine there's just as much uh, sunlight as there is on land on average but uh making these things stable and sturdy is not going to be easy you need a real company i see hyundai is doing a little bit of work on that mm -hmm. uh, on this on the uh the solar on water thing but it's it's going to come, I imagine, and uh, how much or little charisma I have with it, uh, somebody else is going to probably do it. Well, char charisma, but also ideas. It's I mean, you you are an inventor, so you bring more than just the the passion and the the wish. You know, you you know, you read enough science fiction, you know, so that no, you... no, I don't. I wish I <laughs> right, because there's not enough hours enough in the day. Fiction, it's too right. much. <clears throat> You're a Dave Barry fan, by the way, right? Say again? You're a Dave Barry fan as well. Oh, I love Dave Barry, yeah. Me too. I was born and raised yeah. in Miami, so that the humor really hits home. Um, he, he is one really, really funny guy. And yeah. I might add, uh, if, if you read my little bio, he is one of four people, uh, four authors that I mentioned, the others being P.J. O'Rourke, 100% life free as of a few weeks ago. Um, Tom Clancy, 100% life free as of 10 years ago, but you'd never know it from his books. And, um, there was, uh, who was the other one other than Dave Barry, of course. Um, uh, I don't oh, remember. John I have them. Carre, John right. Carre, who, uh, who just died a couple of years ago. The, these were all wonderful writers, but Dave Barry is still alive. And yeah. I'm looking forward to more columns if he has the time. You use the term life free. That's interesting. Yeah. Is well, that your term? One way of saying dead. I, yeah. I like it. Optimistic, you know? <laughs> it certainly is. Uh, tell me, before we get to closing questions and, and uh, audience questions, uh, and by the way, anybody in the virtual audience, just request an invite to speak, and, and Dr. Lisa will bring you up on stage. Talk about, uh, is it SETI? Is that the, the correct pronunciation? Sure. Yeah, and just like nobody knows anything about space aliens, you can pronounce it any way you want. But that's that's pretty much it. I got uh, even tied, right? Yeah, yeah, and thank you. Cause You're welcome. It's amazing how many people say even tied without checking, but it's it's even tied. It's a real word. I used to say uh, that. Yeah. 
I'm reformed. Hey. I got educated. Okay. All <laughs> right. We'll let you we'll let you stay life present. <laughs> so SETI ninety uh, I think it was ninety three or ninety four, Congress cut off all the funding for SETI. Looking for little green men, not on Which was an, a NASA program, correct? Vehicles. But NASA yeah, was involved was, in that research. Right. It was yeah. a, absolutely. It was a NASA program. And when you, the, the other thing that happened in 94 or 93 was the superconducting super collider, which they were trying to build in Waxahachie, Texas. And they lost the funding for that too. Now that would have been $10 billion, whereas SETI was, I don't know how much it was, but it wasn't very much. Uh, hundreds of thousands, millions, whatever, but you can spend whatever you want. I, I had the notion that I could look for space aliens myself, but it would be much better to start an organization where you could get a bunch of people looking because who knows what the right way to do it is. You know, I have an idea. You set up a radio dish, you look for signals, but somebody else might say, well, gee, let me look in this, uh, this handful of sand for some artifacts. Anyway, uh, we put together uh, this thing called the SETI League, setileague.org, if anyone's curious. And uh, we have been, I am very proud to say, just as successful as NASA hmm. and just as successful as the other organizations looking for space aliens. None of us have found a thing. So there you go. So are you deducting that they're not there or you just haven't found them yet? Uh it's a little bit discouraging, but I would imagine. Uh, the way I look at it is that all the searches that we've done, we the SETI League and, and much larger organizations have only, uh, as our uh, executive, executive director emeritus would say, scratched the surface of places that we can look, of different frequencies, of different places, uh, of different detection algorithms, etc., so uh, on the other hand, hopefully I would accomplish this or somebody would before we go life free. But I mean, it's, it's so obvious to me that there's life elsewhere in the universe. Eventually, it'll, uh, we'll find out. And your organization has members from around the world, uh, sure. many of them scientists and uh, and incredibly bright people like yourself. So not just conspiracy theory, late AM radio call in uh, <laughs> type conversations. Well, well we don't really know. We, do, we don't, uh, we don't, <laughs> you don't vet everybody. <laughs> we probably, yeah, we're, we're very ecumenical with respect to taking people's dues. Mm -hmm. uh, I just saw that uh, one yeah, of your, uh, back with us. yeah, your coworkers, Christian is uh, joining our conversation. Hi, Christian. Uh, this actually is Chris Rossetti in San Francisco. Oh, it's Chris. Yeah. I got it wrong. Hi, Chris. How are you? Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> oh, not at all. Nice to hear from you. What's uh, your question or comment? Well, I'm enjoying the interview. I uh, Thank you. spent most of my childhood in Miami, Florida as well. And I remember the 60s building a, a radio set, you know, that I got from uh, some hobby shop and stringing the wire out in the backyard to receive some kind of a scrambled, you know, signal. But my question is this, in light of emergency situations, be it natural or man-made, is anything being really done to affect communications between responding agencies? It seems like every time something happens, very critical, that communications, for some reason, we can't talk to the firemen, the firemen can't talk to the EMT, the EMT can't talk to the police, the police can't talk to the National Guard. There's all kinds of communication problems. Is anything being done nationally or worldwide to solve that seemingly easy problem, maybe? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, well, oddly enough, I actually can speak to that with, uh, with at least the minicum of authority. Uh, there's an organization called APCO, uh, Association of Public Communicators, something like that. I don't even know exactly what it stands for. But uh, one division of our company is, uh, is involved in uh, making recorders for public service, and we're we're members of that organization. I, I don't really have a whole lot to do with it, but uh, the term you're looking for is interoperability, and it's a it's a moving target because, for instance, if you call nine one one some years ago, 
uh, maybe you'll get through with voice. Now they're now they're taking text. They're no, they know where you are, and um, sure, this this is moving along. I'm I'm surprised that uh, that it's as bad as as you say it is, uh, but it's it's certainly being worked on. Thanks for answering that. That's a great question, Chris. I appreciate you joining the conversation. Uh, hey, Richard, before I get to my closing questions, I'm curious what's changed about your perspective in life as you've gotten older? <laughs> well, um, I, I should tout a website that doesn't exist. A, n- a number of years ago, I got the idea uh, of answering that question at some great length, because to be sure, things have changed a lot. So I purchased the domain name askafossil.com. <laughs> and, and I maintain that. I just don't have a website up there yet. But as, as you get older, and when I was young, I, I was even more optimistic than I am now. I said, you know, I'm going to sign up for this TWA trip to the moon. Uh, I'm hopeful that they'll actually figure out, uh, as, as Woody Allen put it, uh, gee, I'd like to achieve immortality, not through my works, but by living forever. And I've kind of given up on that. I'm, I'm a little bit too old to, uh, to hope for that kind of medical breakthrough. So you start thinking nearer term, uh, you don't, you don't think about, uh, although I have saved the world a few times in my blog, I'm not really going to do that, i sad to say. And uh, sure, you, you get old. You uh, Did you read about my ailment timer? No, I haven't read that one. Oh, well, um, the way that works is you get a little sand timer, a little hourglass. Mm-hmm. And when you're with a group of older guys, you pass it around and you turn it over. And when the sand runs out, you have to stop talking about your ailments and move to the next one. So that would, <laughs> that's, that is great. And I would imagine you can make an app for that as well. Uh, or, unless you yeah, want to stay analog yeah, on that. Yeah. No, no, you, you want to have the physical device. Yeah. It's, it needs to be tactile. Uh, and, yeah. And, and you can see the sand running out. Cause if it's an app, <laughs> somebody's looking at their phone and, and nobody, nobody else can see it. But, you know, you're in a little group around a table. Boy, you know, my lumbago, whatever that is, is acting up. And suddenly the sand runs out. You have to give it to the guy with a bad knee. Um, <laughs> I'm very fortunate. I'm, I'm in good shape at the moment. Obviously, that's not going to last forever. And, uh, and you have to deal with that. You look really healthy and vibrant. Do you... Do you eat well? Do you exercise? What's what's been your practice through your whole life, or is that just genetics? Uh, I I would have to credit my uh, my parents to some extent. Of course, I, I would hearken back to uh, chocolate and uh, Costco and Lint and Godiva and Toysher and uh, and everyone in between, including even Hershey. And, really um, interesting. And using Lipitor as a lifestyle drug because uh, <laughs> my di- my diet is atrocious, but my cholesterol is great. So uh, <laughs> that plus the fact that living in Sedona, which is a small town, uh, I walk everywhere. Uh, I, and I try to get in my 10,000 steps a day and I'm frequently successful. And I usually use those steps to go to the gym. So uh, <laughs> I try to keep in shape and so far so good. Have you done that your whole life when you were no, in your no, 20s I, and in the studio? No, uh, absolutely. Uh, hearkening back to your previous question, how do I see things differently now from then? When I turned 50, I realized that if I, if I kept up my current lifestyle, which was basically leaning over a light table uh, and uh, eating bonbons on the couch... Uh, I would probably die a lot sooner. So I said, no, I've got to go on a diet. I've got to weigh what I should, uh, whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, made made some uh, mental changes that uh, mm-hmm. that turned me into whatever it is I am now. Bravo. I, I started training in martial arts when I turned 40, too. And it was... It should was... I move back? <laughs> no, because I like you. <laughs> 
Oh, oh. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean anything, you know. That's you a good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, son, I um, I'm not sure that the martial arts would would translate through. You would know better than I. If I punched you virtually, yeah. would it hurt you physically? Well, I, I have written many times about, you know, when I start babbling on my blog, I say, wait a minute, a hand just came through the screen and grabbed my grabbed me by the neck. So who knows? Yeah, it's a great concept. Mm -hmm. so, um, Lisa, do we have any audience members or shall I get to my, my final I questions? I think you can go on to your final question. Fantastic. Yep. By the way, anything else you want to chime in on before I do? No, I am good. I, this, has been, this has been wonderful. Entertaining? I, reading, I think I've read his bio like four times. Um, I don't know why I keep thinking something new is going to pop up. It's just refreshingly entertaining and off the beaten path. Lisa, and I thank just, you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, your shirt, is that an even tied shirt? And what is the graphic on it? Because it's banging. I really love it. I haven't seen that design. Uh, it, it, is, it is an even tied shirt. We have been making t-shirts for, uh, for the 50 years we've been in existence. And in fact, uh, their very first t-shirt that we ever made, which was a VU meter on the back and a delay line on the front, uh, was made by a current resident and native of Florida, uh, Suzanne Lanier, who I'm sure is not in the audience here, but if she were, um, we've been in touch all these years and she, uh, she did great art, but, uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. But this is, uh, this is a DNA thing. This is the even tied logo. And I'm not quite sure. I guess that's a gear. <laughs> I, That's I as far as I got uh, the E in the gear, and I didn't know what the rest of the graphic yeah. was. Yeah, the uh, I think the guy who designed this one, uh, Joe Waltz, uh, is is a bit of an artist, and uh, and I think this is one of his. Although uh, Nalia, our uh, our marketing department, uh, did a lot of them as well. And so, do you have a merch store for T-shirts and hats and things like that on the yeah. Eventide site? Sure. Cool. Everybody go check that out. Also, check out the gear. I wanted to ask you if, if you've got five more minutes before I get to these oh, questions. All right, I've, okay. got, I've, I've got all the time in the world. The other thing Thanks, I wanted, wanted to mention, since you're talking about uh, uh, merch, etc., we also have a, uh, a blog just like yours, except it's audio, uh, called Gear Club. And um, it's interviews with musicians and uh, tragically people like me and recording <laughs> engineers and producers. Uh, so you get filler and you get talent. And where can people find that? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's easy enough to find. It's either gear dash club.com or net or whatever. Uh, Tony is, uh, is in charge of that. He's the producer and the uh, person uh, responsible for it. And it's got some really, really interesting, uh, interesting people on there. Thanks for letting us know about that. Yeah. I want to ask you, before I get to my three closing questions, I want to ask you about Eventide and what's next, because I'm, I'm fascinated because you've been gear, you know, outboard gear oriented for years. One of the leaders in the field, hands down worldwide. And then you've gotten into software of course, which I've just finally joined that part of the revolution and got yeah. my first Eventide software, uh, which I'm loving. And you also are reintegrating, oh, you've been doing it for a few years now, but pedals, you know, which is kind of interesting because everything was rack mounted before and, and you found a need for us guitarist and, and Jean-Luc Ponty violinist, um, you know, Live for live musicians to have it on the floor so that they could uh, use it as a as a regular pedal, um, and I think it's really cool that you're integrating all of those things. Where's the future for Eventide? Like what in your in your dreams? Not just what you're working on now. And I know there's some cool things coming up. Um, there's some secret project that's going on um, that I had read only, about. Only one. I. <laughs> well, that's a, so. There's many secret projects, yeah. uh, that that would make sense. I but hope, I got. I hope so. They they haven't told me, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's coming? And like, in in your wildest dreams, what what would be something that you would like to to do with your company? Well, um, 
this is not my wildest dream. This is this is something uh, I'd like to do if if we've got uh, got the resources. Because you know, as 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 long as we've been around, we we still are not infinitely uh, capable of doing as many things as we'd like. Uh, uh, I have a saying, which is basically, well, you know, you got millions of guitar players, but everybody has a voice. And I've always been fascinated because I'm, I'm a radio guy. I uh, ham radio, broadcast radio, whatever. And uh, I can think of a lot of things that uh, that we could and should do uh, in the voice area. That's uh, that's something we actually can do and probably will at some point. But if you want my wildest dreams, you know, you're talking about uh, implants and and, you know, things things attached to your brain. I talk about science fiction. There's an old A.E. Van Vogt story by uh, uh, by him, who's I guess I don't know, he must have died 20 years ago. But he had a story once called Fulfillment short story came out in the 50s. And I'll give him credit for uh having a computer person partnership. Uh, I haven't read that for a long time. But you know, you, you can you can dream about anything. I'm sure uh, the meta company is, is dreaming mm-hmm. about more meta-ness. And, uh, you know, so you can you can take that as, uh, as two answers, one for something that's definitely possible. And, uh, and another that uh, will be possible, but maybe we won't see it, probably. And do you think, what's, where's your stand on accountability, you know, for companies that are, you know, doing meta and, you know, Facebook or Twitter or, or companies that have this great technology um, and then don't really know how to straddle the, the moral compass of, I mean, it doesn't have so much to do with digital delays and reverbs, but um, mm-hmm. in general with technology, do you have a... An opinion on that? Well, I'm I'm going to take one small step into politics, which I uh, typically eschew, mm-hmm. and uh, I would say that everyone, which is to say, the public, the companies, and the government, are all learning, and we will be learning how best to deal with this. Um, my own personal opinion is I don't know. I uh, I don't worry about this stuff. Uh, Again, being old, I think it's safe for me to watch anything on a screen and not worry that it's going to corrupt what's left of my brain. (laughs) Children, I don't know. But uh, we're learning as we go along. I'm pretty sure we're more likely to survive that, uh, however it turns out, than we are uh, other things that could be happening. Thanks for answering that. My final questions. the first is, since this show is called Making It, what does making it mean to you both personally and professionally? You didn't tell me you were going to ask me that. Uh, well, it's got the colloquial meaning, obviously, success. And making it for me is uh, exactly what you'd expect. You know, back when I was young, I could actually see electronic components. I could breathe in the fumes from the soldering iron without worrying too much about uh, Dane Bramage. And uh, you make stuff and you get to be successful. I, I don't really have a good theoretical or uh, hypothetical answer for that. But Any answer is good. But, but you know, the that cool thing true. is, you as you were answering the question, Richard, sorry to interrupt, but you literally physically have been making it because you've been making things you've sure. been visualizing yeah. and then making things your whole life. So I, I hadn't really thought and about I, that. And I love it. Yeah. Can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Uh, well, let's, let's see. One of them is uh, pick the, uh, pick healthy parents. Uh, two, would be never let your classwork interfere with your education. (laughs) And three, give me just a second to think about that. Don't listen to your mother. She'll Hmm. worry too much. Right. What you want. There you go. Thank you. And I thought one of those three would be, you know, luck (laughs) because you've mentioned luck throughout this conversation. I I write that in my blog all the time. I, I write, you know, be lucky. Be lucky. <laughs> yeah. 
that's a great phrase. I'm I'm gonna start incorporating that into my sure. my daily life. Yeah, absolutely. Because again, like you said, it's not about just about tenacity and focus and passion and talent and all the things that are generally factors in having a, a beautiful life, which you yeah. are having. Um, it's joyful, it's playful, it's productive. Um, you make the, the world a better place with can can I can I tell you a really quick story that I wrote up on my blog, which is probably the saddest thing I've ever written. Uh, mm. the, the the title of it is Susan the Dead Ex Roommate. Mm. And um, she was a woman who uh, who I knew back when we started the company and through a combination of circumstances uh, was sort of uh, sort of reconnected maybe 20 years ago. And she was a singer. Uh, she called herself Susan Blue, but that wasn't her, uh, her real name. And she was, uh, she was a good singer, maybe not the best in the world, but, but good, talented, could have been successful. But she wasn't lucky. And maybe she, she wasn't talented enough she didn't, maybe she didn't work hard enough, but the title of the blog says it all, Susan, the dead ex roommate. And it's what can happen uh, if, if you don't get lucky. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're not, maybe you shouldn't be in that particular business. I don't know, but uh, I, I'm reluctant to talk about it, but that's why I wrote about it because I, I don't have a lot of sadness going on and uh, that's just another side. I will read it when we're done with this conversation and uh, and appreciate you sharing that story as well. It's um, we're in a brutal business. Yeah. You know, being being in the arts is not for the faint of heart. Amen. Yeah. My final question to you, Richard and then you can have closing thoughts is at this point of your life with everything that you know, to be true, what would you tell your younger self? Berkshire Hathaway and in, in, in the, uh, in the sixties. Yeah. Sell that then buy Microsoft and then Tesla or, or Amazon. Why else? Why wouldn't I give my <laughs> younger self really good advice? That's some of the best advice I've heard from any of the guests that I've <laughs> interviewed in the last five years. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if, you, if you have the opportunity, listen, you know, go back, <laughs> take care of that. Absolutely. Um, closing thoughts, anything else you'd like to share? No, this, is, this has been a lot of fun because, uh, you know, normally it's uh, how did even tide get started? How did whatever? Nobody's asked me about my canoeing plaque. So I've had a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> You're so welcome. That was one of the things I was very interested in, in talking about today. Uh, this has been really fun. So anyway, Richard, thank you. It's, it's really a pleasure to finally meet you uh, virtually. Likewise. And um, thanks for all the great products that you've made over the years. And I, I also want to uh, thank our our virtual audience for joining us today. Also, Dr. Lisa, of course. And, and I want to thank my team. They're yes. amazing. To my, to my left and my right and everyone who works at Eventide, because when you say me, um, I'm enjoying the fruits of everybody else's labor at this point. We got, we've got wonderful engineers and wonderful everybody's. Your staff is great. And, and it's so great that at this point of your life, you get to just enjoy the fruits of your labors continue to be creative but but surround yourself with great people who um who basically help carry your vision forward well when i wrote be lucky that was advice from my younger self to my older self there it is absolutely a pleasure talking with you thanks for spending the hour with us today richard and uh, everybody go check out the blog the uh, the website of course and um tony's uh, show that he does as well of interviewing other artists and <clears throat> creators because there's a lot of great information there as well for everybody. That's it. This has been a blast. One of the most fun interviews that, <laughs> that we've had on the show. For, for um, me as well. And, th and thank you, Dr. Lisa. Oh, thank you. This has been a refreshing breath of fresh air. Glad thank to hear you. it.
Terry, Thanks, another everybody. one out the park. <laughs> there we go. Um, take good care. Everybody stay inspired and stay safe. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Richard. Bye, everybody. Thank Thanks, Eventide. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Woolman.